taught that they're on even when the light's red. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Good. 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 <laughs> good principle. That's right. Well, good morning. Welcome to those joining us in person here and online to this discussion at Hudson Institute, uh, where scholars research, analyze, and make recommendations that embrace American leadership, global engagement, in the furtherance of security, freedom, and prosperity. Before the new year, the Pentagon released the China Military Power Report which, in my view, is one of the best unclassified documents that really outlines Chinese capabilities and their national intent. And um, I, as I was over the Christmas holiday, I was, I was reading kind of the, the rollout uh, from various officials of this report, and I came across a great event that Dr. Dr. Ratner had done at AEI, um, which is what prompted this, this, this whole idea of doing this, because the environment is very fluid. It's very dynamic. And even as good as that report is, there's still things that are moving. And, and in that event uh, that Dr. Ratner was a part of, um, he had mentioned something that, that various officials have continued to, to amplify, and that's that this year, 2023, is going to be very important for the United States as we um, seek to do things that would, uh, that would deter what we believe um, are, are Chinese uh, uh, potential plans to do things against U.S. interests. Um, and this audience is very familiar with the PRC's conventional military modernization, um, but as the previous STRATCOM commander and then the current STRATCOM commander have warned, China is also engaged in a strategic breakout of its nuclear weapons program. Uh, China is making uh, their nuclear triad mature um, and, and more capable. Um, but we're not, also, we're not only concerned about, of course, Chinese capabilities. China has also become more aggressive in its uh, operational behaviors, provocations in the East and South China Seas. And, um, and also, as, as articulated very well in the report, the, the China military challenges are not strictly regional. The PLA is expanding its presence globally, pursuing installations around the world, which underscores its ambitions to contest the United States and the interests of, our, of ourselves and our allies, um, interests that Americans have benefited from for decades. And we've, learned, we've heard from several DOD officials, again, that, that, that we are um, on the early end, I believe, and I'd love to hear um, from our guests more about what we're doing um, uh, to, in response to this. And so we're very eager to hear from these uh, wonderful, um, prestigious guests that we have here today. And so what, what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna turn the floor over to my, to my colleague here, Patrick. He will introduce our guests and then begin with a, the first uh, series of questions. And then we hope to save some time at the end for questions from the audience. So with that, Patrick. Well, Rebecca, thank you very much. Um, you know, what a uh, great pleasure it is, as Rebecca Heinrichs has just suggested, to have Eli Ratner and Lindsay Ford here from the Pentagon taking some time out. If you were looking for the best person possible for the Defense Department of the United States to take on the pacing challenge of China, you would look quickly to someone like Dr. Eli Ratner. I mean, his <coughs> academic pedigree, his research pedigree, um, it, what he's done before in terms of the White House, uh, at, at working for the Vice President, then Joe Biden as Vice President, but also at the State Department back in the great days of Scarborough Shoal, uh, working on the Office of China-Mongolian Affairs. He's been there, thinking about these issues, um, constantly writing about them, uh, so it's a really great pleasure. And we're going to ask Eli to kick things off here with a, a brief comments, but first let me just say a few words about Lindsay Ford, because we're also delighted. She's an exceptional public servant who's also been thinking about these things analytically at places like Brookings uh, in the Asia, uh, 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 Asia Society Policy Center, or Institute. Um, but she's got experience working in the Office of the Secretary of Defense on the things she's doing now and she's in charge of as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South Asia and Southeast Asia, things like the first US um, ASEAN, that's the Association of Southeast Asian Nation Defense Ministerial. You know, that was something she designed, thinking about the maritime strategy when you're thinking about the South China Sea. So we're really dealing with people who are, are, have been at the cutting edge for the, especially the past decade or more, uh, on these critical issues. So 
without further ado, let me turn it over to Eli and then to Lindsay for opening comments, and then Rebecca Heinrichs and I will have a few questions, and then eventually we'll open up to the uh, audience. Thank okay. You. Well, thank you, uh, Patrick and Rebecca. Thank you to Hudson for the opportunity to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, the one part of my important part of my uh, resume, which Patrick did not mention, is that uh, when I left the State Department in 2012, I had the opportunity to work for and with Patrick and learned an enormous amount from him at that time and continue to benefit from his knowledge and experience. So uh, uh, please take credit for whatever has come since then. Um, so as uh, Rebecca mentioned, uh, there has been a lot of anticipation around the activities this year. Um, we had a chance to talk with friends at AEI in December and preview uh, what we were looking toward. And I think the uh, fact is we find ourselves here now uh, only at the beginning of March, and it's already been really a breakthrough year for U.S. alliances and partnerships uh, in the Indo-Pacific, really groundbreaking um, right out of the gate as it relates to delivering on major initiatives with respect to capabilities, posture, interoperability, and otherwise building upon a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years coming to fruition. Um, we saw that uh, in the Secretary's recent trip to the Philippines. Um, and we were meant to meet just after that trip. I was called to testify before the Foreign Relations Committee just before that. That's a hard thing to say no to. So uh, it was an obligation that I had to fulfill, but glad to, glad to be here today. But uh, this was Secretary Austin's second trip to Manila, first trip of the year. Uh, had a chance to meet with troops down in southern Philippines, uh, also with President Marcos and the whole new national security team. Uh, out in Manila and uh, was able to provide a major announcement out of that visit of an agreement on four new EDCA sites uh, in the Philippines, which provides access for uh, U.S. forces to uh, Philippine uh, military sites, uh, which is really going to help our ability to deepen the alliance, respond more effectively to crises and contingencies in the South China Sea, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, uh, and otherwise. And we've got a lot of momentum uh, in the Philippines relationship. That's one that Lindsay manages day to day, uh, and we're looking forward to other big engagements this year. I think a really exciting part of the uh, Asia Pacific portfolio, and one that uh, Lindsay and I have both been working on for, for quite a time now. Um, on the day which we were after that we returned from Manila, uh, Secretary Austin met with Deputy Minister Marles uh, from Australia, who's also uh, dual hatted as the defense minister. They had a great discussion about uh, where we are on AUKUS, which uh, we are feeling quite good about, making strong progress, heading toward the really the end game of the consultation period, um, and also having an opportunity with Minister Marles to discuss uh, a number of the initiatives that came out of uh, Osman at the end of last year associated with new posture efforts to enhance uh, uh, the number and activities of U.S. forces throughout Australia and across domains, so really an important set of initiatives there. Um, and of course, just prior to that, in early January, we had uh, our 2 plus 2 at Japan, uh, which uh, for those of us, and, and Patrick has spent a huge amount of his career working on that relationship, I think it's really a historic meeting, historic set of announcements uh, in the context of Japan's new national security strategy, uh, major announcements on posture, uh, U.S. posture in particular, the first forward deployment of the Marine Littoral Regiment uh, in Japan, which is really important for the, uh, our, our capabilities inside the first island chain, as well as a number of announcements as it relates to the alliance. Um, and I'll just say, kind of wrapping this up, uh, as part of the trip to Manila, Secretary also went to uh, Seoul had a chance to meet, uh, obviously, with his counterpart, Minister Lee, as well as uh, President Yoon. They had a great discussion about the alliance, about all the efforts we've been taking to revitalize a number of the, uh, our alliance activities that had atrophied over previous years, and, and talked specifically about the steps we're taking uh, to strengthen um, our U.S. extended deterrence commitment, which has been something we may want to get into in a little more detail. Uh, and then the final relationship I do want to mention, another one that, that Lindsay is managing day to day, is the India relationship, where we're making a lot of investments and spending a lot of time at senior levels uh, to, as we describe, uphold a favorable balance of power in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and you may have seen the launch of a new technology dialogue, the ISET, uh, with India in January, which is part of a broader effort to try to deepen 
our co-development, co-production activities uh, with India, which is an important uh, priority for Prime Minister Modi and for India, but an important priority for the United States as well um, as we make our defense industrial bases closer and more integrated. Um, I will say, Rebecca, just following up on your description of the security environment, it does continue to evolve. It does continue to be more challenging. I think that's why we're seeing uh, much of the um, activity that we're seeing with our partners, um, and we are seeing a, a PLA that is growing more capable, but as you described, growing also more willing to take risk, uh, more willing to use the uh, military instrument of power in a way that we haven't seen uh, in previous eras. Um, that has manifested itself in unsafe intercepts, which is an issue uh, that I have talking, been talking about, that the Secretary has been talking about, uh, and is of particular concern insofar as we have seen the number of uh, unsafe, dangerous PLA activity, particularly in the air domain, against the United States, against allies and partners, engaging in lawful activity in international airspace in accordance with international law, uh, being approached by PLA aircraft in ways that are, <coughs> excuse me, uh, destabilizing and potentially dangerous. And we saw this against an Australian P-8 in the South China Sea last June, uh, where the PLA fighter released chaff that was ingested by an Australian aircraft, quite dangerous activity. Uh, we've seen PLA harassment, dangerous maneuvers around Canadian aircraft that are involved in the enforcement of UN Security Council resolutions. So here's a uh, ally of the United States um, on the other side of the world helping to enforce UN Security Council resolutions against North Korea, uh, resolutions with China voted for, and the PLA is coming out and intercepting these aircraft uh, in a dangerous way and, and uh, uh, doing it multiple times. Um, and then, of course, you heard from Indopaycom in December uh, of a similar event of a, a PLA Navy aircraft coming within 20 feet of a US aircraft, again, um, uh, quite dangerous. And these aren't isolated incidents. This is a, a pattern of behavior uh, and it's, it's dangerous and destabilizing. Um, and it comes alongside uh, other, uh, what we would describe as sort of coercive, malign PLA activity around the region. Uh, you mentioned the Philippines. We've seen the PRC maritime militia um, massing vessels around contested features, or what they would call contested features that are in the Philippines, EEZ. Uh, we saw an, an event or an incident uh, just in the last couple of weeks with the PRC Coast Guard directing a um, military-grade laser at uh, the Philippines crew, dangerous for the crew, dangerous uh, in terms of operational behavior around 2nd Thomas Shoal. Secretary Austin had a chance to speak with his Philippines counterpart shortly that after that event, and that was an important opportunity for them to sync up on how we're going to deepen our cooperation in the face of that kind of behavior. Um, but we are seeing this kind of activity, and of course, for uh, close South China Sea Watchers, uh, in which Lindsay and I uh, are part of that club, <laughs> as is Patrick, uh, uh, and others uh, around town here. Uh, we have seen, you may have seen the news about uh, covert uh, PRC maritime militia land reclamation in the South China Sea, which is uh, really destabilizing activity and, and big news for, for the region. So. Uh, this is a pattern of behavior. It is happening across the region. It extends out, of course, to the LAC uh, and, and against India. Um, and it is, I think, reformulating and informing our approach, but also um, creating urgency around the kind of uh, activity that we're engaged in with, with our allies and partners. I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay in just a minute. But I will say, I do think amidst um, a world and a news cycle. Rebecca said when we were outside, I hope you have some good news because, man, things feel tough these days. In a, in, in a world of, uh, you know, a lot of challenges, I think that the story of uh, the U.S. position in the region and the degree to which we are deepening our partnerships with our allies and partners, the degree to which they're investing in their own capabilities, their ability to co contribute to regional security, and the degree to which they're working with, with each other uh, is really uh, news for optimism. And I think it is creating a more stable uh, and enduring security environment, even as these challenges from the PRC become more intense. So I do think it is a, uh, I have optimism about the direction we're heading, in part based upon 
uh, some of these items. But let me turn it over to Lindsay uh, to, to build upon and, and add. Thanks, Eli. Um, I guess picking up on perhaps the optimistic side of the equation, um, Eli laid out a lot of the work we've been doing bilaterally on our alliances and partnerships in the Indo-Pacific. But I think we uh, are very pleased about the progress that has been made over the last year um, and what we anticipate to be a very busy season ahead in 2023 um, for mini and multilateral cooperation. Um, and really, I think, bringing much more concrete initiatives behind some of the work that's been underway for a long time, thinking about how we network alliances and partnerships in the Indo-Pacific region together. That's been something uh, that certainly is not new as an effort for the Biden administration. This has been something that multiple administrations have been working on um, because the security architecture in the Indo-Pacific is different from what we have in Europe. Uh, it's a little more fluid, uh, and it has multiple uh, institutions, but also what we would consider more coalitions, um, operational coalitions, and we're looking at how we bring all those together. Um, so in the past year, uh, some of the things that I think we've been most pleased about, certainly the US, Australia, Japan uh, trilateral cooperation, I think has been at the leading edge of what we are doing um, on the minilateral front. We're looking at ways that we're integrating Japan into some of the US, Australia force posture work we're doing right now. So including Japan and rotational training exercises we'll be doing in Northern Australia. Um, and the secretary has been meeting uh, not just bilaterally, but trilaterally, repeatedly with his counterparts to talk about what's next. Um, US-Japan ROK trilateral cooperation, I think is also in a really good uh, spot where we're seeing a lot of progress. Things like anti-submarine warfare exercises, ballistic missile defense exercises that we consider really important as we're looking at how we continue to deter what has really been an increasing pace of DPRK provocations recently. The other thing I would flag that I think has gotten less attention because it's relatively newer but was a big topic of conversation for us when we were in Manila recently is U.S., Japan, um, and Philippine trilateral cooperation. Um, so just this past year, we looked at uh, the trilateral defense policy dialogue as a new trilateral dialogue that we launched between those three countries. Recently, the Philippine, Japan, and U.S. Army chiefs met ever for their uh, met the first time for their first trilateral meeting. And I think you're going to see a lot of uh, increased high-level engagement uh, between those three countries in the coming year. Um, I think also we're really pleased recently, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Marles from Australia uh, held meetings with his Philippine counterparts. A lot of work underway between Australia and the Philippines as well, looking at what we can do trilaterally there. So I think a lot of the work that you've heard for a very long time around the idea uh, of greater minilateral cooperation is now really beginning to come to fruition in the Indo-Pacific, um, and that's something we're really pleased about. Um, of course, uh, the Quad, which I know is always a topic of great interest, um, though the Defense Department is not the leading edge of Quad cooperation, um, we are particularly pleased that the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative, which was something that was launched at the last Quad Summit, we see as exactly the kind of work that the Quad should be doing. It is just focused on bringing practical public goods to the region, how we begin to build a common operating picture in the maritime space, which I think for those of us who work on maritime security has been an ambition for a very long time. And we are now harnessing new technologies uh, between countries that have the capacity to do that, to bring that uh, to Southeast Asia is where we sort of started the pilot of IPMDA. And I think leading up to uh, new Quad meetings, you're going to see that initiative uh, grow and expand uh, into other parts of the region. And then I would say, finally, of course, uh, we are continuing, despite all this minilateral cooperation, to really invest in ASEAN and our ASEAN engagement. So Secretary Austin was at the ASEAN Defense Ministerial uh, in Cambodia in November. Um, we talked about a number of new initiatives that we have underway with ASEAN. One I would really point to that we're particularly excited about is our new um, ASEAN Emerging Defense Leaders Initiative that we're focused on. Um, we think that for some time, the initiative, the Obama administration started YSEALI, the Young Southeast Asia uh, Leaders Initiative, has been one of the most positive elements of our cooperation uh, with Southeast Asian countries and with ASEAN, where we have a really young, dynamic, growing population. And we wanted to do something similar on the defense side. So this is a way that we begin to bring together um, emerging leaders on the US side with a lot of our ASEAN counterparts um, to really sort of strengthen uh, that network going forward. 
So those are just a few of the kind of multilateral initiatives that we have underway, um, which are really complementary to a lot of the work Eli developed. Um, and I think when you look at that all together, you should take away that the picture here is one in which the US and other partners are creating a security architecture that is going to be a lot more resilient. Um, and we're going to see a lot more going on on a practical basis. It's not just words, it's actions. Thanks. Well, uh, it's exhausting just to listen to the breadth of what you do as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian Pacific Affairs and the DASDI for South and Southeast Asia uh, and your other colleagues there at the Pentagon. What, what you're doing in terms of building this lattice work of, of sort of national, bilateral, minilateral, and multilateral uh, institutions. There, now, there's a reason why these allies and partners are so ready for cooperation. And it's not just your brilliance in, in, in your planning, which is part of it. Um, it, is, it is the threat, the environment. So uh, let's just start by um, going back to, uh, if not the PLA report, why has China embarked on such a massive military buildup? And, and how do you see the threat of deterrence failing in Asia in terms of uh, as, a, as a growing possibility? How would you characterize it, Eli and, and, and Lindsay as well? Yeah, well, it, it's a good set of questions. Those are, those are obviously big questions. I think the uh, simplest uh, answer to your first question about why is the PRC doing this is, uh, you know, one of the striking things about the strategy documents that have come out of the Biden administration to me, if you look back right out of the gate with the interim national security strategy document that, we, that came out right at the beginning of the administration, national security strategy, the national defense strategy, the China military power report is a line that is repeated again and again, which is that the PRC is the only country uh, with the capability and the intent in uh, essentially overthrowing the international order as we know it in a way that runs directly counter to vital US national interests. And that has been recognized. And it is the, the marriage of the power and the intent and the ambition uh, that I think we do see as a as a serious challenge, and we see that uh, manifested in uh, a challenge to the order in the Indo-Pacific, the rules of the road, the institutions, um, the norms, the uh, uh, efforts to undermine U.S. alliances and partnerships. Um, uh, we see the sort of the execution of that strategy underway. Um, I think that directly links to your second question, which is how does this relate to deterrence? Uh, I think what, what we are aiming to do is to ensure that we are working on our own capabilities, but, al but also with allies and partners, to ensure that uh, that kind of coercion and aggression uh, doesn't succeed. Um, and from a deterrence perspective, uh, very focused on, uh, as Deputy, Deputy Secretary Hicks said recently, and then interestingly, uh, Representative Gallagher echoed her almost verbatim a couple days later in the Wall Street Journal that, that uh, when leaders wake up in Beijing, they, they think today is not the day. Um, our assessment is that that is true right now, that deterrence is real, deterrence is strong, uh, and we're doing everything we can to make sure it stays that way uh, tomorrow and into the future. And, and I think we can do it. I think we can do it. I was asked uh, at the Foreign Relations Committee hearing that uh, landed on the day when we had previously scheduled this event, at the very end of um, uh, Senator Rubio's question. He said, I just have one question. He had five <laughs> seconds left in, in his tie. He said, you know, yes or no answer. Uh, do you think there's any chance that we can make it to the end of the decade uh, without essentially a PRC in invasion of Taiwan, without a breakdown in the kind of deterrence that you're talking about? And my answer was yes, I, I think we do. It's not going to be easy. The challenge is enormous. The capabilities are growing. The ambition is there. We know that. Uh, but what we're doing is reinforcing that deterrence, ensuring that the costs of aggression remain unacceptably high to Beijing. And I think we have a, a pathway to do that through our own uh, development of our own capabilities, revision of our posture, uh, introduction of new operational concepts, uh, and then all of the work we're doing with allies and partners. And then, of course, the entire whole of government effort, which is uh, as important as the military piece, economics, uh, diplomacy and others that, that reinforce that deterrence. So I think it's doable. It's going to be really hard. Uh, but I think it's uh, we're getting after it with urgency, but also with confidence that we can do it. And if I could just rework this question for, for Lindsay in terms of the, the context of Southeast Asia, where that it was Mike Gallagher, the chairman of this new CCP, CCP committee uh, in Congress, um, said that 
the strategic competition is not a tennis match, right? He was almost channeling Mao, you know, revolution's not a dinner party. Um, but in Southeast Asia and South Asia, uh, Lindsay, strategic competition is, is a very scary thing when you're talking about what China and the U.S. could come to blows over this. So how, how are you managing, and how is the U.S. government and how is DOD managing to build these closer relationships like what you just did in the Philippines, despite the fact that they're also worried about conflict erupting? I mean, I think you've heard uh, the Secretary and other leaders say repeatedly, we say this every time we're in the region, um, that we don't think that our partners in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, in the Indo-Pacific have to choose um, at sort of the strategic uh, level between having a relationship with the United States and having a relationship with China. What we're focused on is making sure that they have the space to make the choices that they want to make and the ones that they think are in their own sovereign interest. And what you see, I think, um, and why um, some of the developments like we had when the Secretary went to the Philippines are possible is because I think increasingly partners feel like they don't actually have the space that they need to defend uh, their own interest and make their own choices. So we see that in places uh, like along the line of actual control uh, between, the United, uh, between uh, China and India, um, where the Chinese are, are continuing, I think, to do things like dual use infrastructure, provocations. We see that in the South China Sea. Um, just by way of anecdote, on one of the trips that I did to Manila, we did a, a roundtable discussion with a bunch of young uh, female national security leaders. And um, the thing that they were focused on, one of them said, you know what upsets me? Uh, I go to the grocery store, and there's this fish. I won't even pretend that I know the name of it. She said, there's this fish. This fish uh, swims in our waters. Like, this is a fish uh, that is well known, has been a part of Philippine cuisine for a really long time. She said, I go to the grocery store, and I buy it, and we're importing that fish from China. <laughs> because our waters are so overfished. Those are the kinds of things that I think on a daily basis come home to countries in the region that this is about their own sovereign economic and security interest and that without the United States there as an ally and partner, they don't actually have the ability to defend those. So I think that's why there's so much interest. And if I could just amplify, Patrick, because I think that this last point that Lindsay makes is really important, which I think to, as you said, it's not just our great diplomatic work that's, that's animating some of this behavior, it's the nature of the threat, but what we hear again and again is as countries are thinking through the formula for how they want to uh, defend and, and protect their sovereignty and their interests, a deeper relationship with the United States remains part of that, and that's fundamentally important. So I think they, they want to see a United States that, that's committed, this administration is committed, uh, but we're part of that formula even as they're going about strengthening their other relationships and strengthening their own capabilities. Thank you. So I want to take us back to the conversation, Eli, uh, about specifically these these uh, operational, like very dangerous, reckless uh, behavior on the part of the PRC. And you talked about how it's it's driving um, ally interest and willingness to collaborate more. But that's very good. But how are we responding to these? How are we leading with our allies in response to these? In in in. Um, collaborating to some extent on how, how restraint to be and you know sort of how we're talking about that. And then also, what are we doing and what are we saying or what are we trying to communicate then to the PRC when these events happen? And then relatedly and more broadly, how are our crisis uh, communications, our lines of communications um, to, to, to try to prevent unintentional um, challenges? Or otherwise, it just it seems to me like they're kind of picking a fight. So, so to, just if you, how, how, could you, how would you respond to that? Well, I don't think they're picking a fight. Uh, they may be trying to coerce and bully, but they're not picking a fight. I think they're smart enough not to do that, uh, and that's an important distinction. Um, the, what we say privately to the PRC and what we say publicly mm -hmm. is exactly the same in response to these activities, which is, number one, we will not be coerced and we will not be bullied uh, if that's what your intent is, and number two, we will continue to fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows. Uh, I think sometimes for folks that sounds trite, mm -hmm. uh, but in this instance it's fundamentally important and fundamentally true. And so we have continued our operations in the face of th uh, this activity. We have not drawn it back uh, in the face of this coercion, nor have we uh, hyper amplified it mm -hmm. uh, in response. We are going about uh, engaging in operations that we believe sustains the rules and norms of uh, the international order, and frankly, I think the world looks to us to do that, and we are continuing to ensure that these kinds of 
activities are not going to create uh, artificial or illegal no-go zones for military, much less economic activity uh, in the region. So that's the, that is the message privately and publicly, is we're going to keep sailing, flying and sailing operate, and we're not going to let this behavior intimidate us. Um, as it relates to the issue of mill-mill relations and crisis communications uh, and engagement with the PLA, I will say we are not where we think we need to be. Uh, the Secretary met with uh, Minister Wei, his counterpart at the time at Shangri-La for the first time last summer. He met with him again on the margins of the ADMM Plus when we were out in Cambodia uh, in the fall. Um, of course, uh, President Biden has been meeting uh, uh, or speaking with President Xi at times, and they have uh, shared the view that military-to-military -military relations uh, are an important uh, channel to keep open. Um, and that has been Secretary Austin's message, which is uh, despite uh, ongoing tensions, it's incredibly important uh, for uh, U.S. and the PRC military to have open lines of communication. But the problem is that the PRC and the PLA continue to use mill mill relations in those channels of communication uh, as a means of signaling displeasure over issues related to security and not. Mm -hmm. And so they will turn off for extended periods of time uh, and be unwilling to engage at times when we think it's important for us to be talking. So for instance, you may have seen uh, on the day that uh, we brought down the PRC spy balloon uh, over uh, the waters above South Carolina, um, immediately Secretary Austin put in a call request uh, to the PRC to say, look, these are the kinds of times that we need to be talking about what our intentions are, uh, what our perspectives are. Uh, that request for engagement was denied. And we've seen similarly with Chairman Milley on other occasions with Secretary Austin, uh, similarly with Admiral Aquilino, as well as some of our working level dialogues that are meant to manage the Paul Mill part of this, our DASD, Michael Chase's uh, dialogues, as well as some of the operational dialogues that Indopaycom uh, holds with the PLA, that they have turned all of that off for now. Uh, mm -hmm. And we think that's uh, destabilizing uh, and dangerous, and we think we both ought to be doing a better job of managing it. That's great. And then if I can just real quick then for Lindsay, too. Um, and, I, and I say pick a fight, though, too, not necessarily for it to escalate, but to, to cause us to do something that they could point to us and say, look what they've done. They've done, you know, like what they did even in the case of the spy balloon. We shot it down over our own airspace, and then they accused us of, of violating um, international norms. Um, but I've just got, since you brought up the spy balloon, let's just stick with spy balloon for just a minute, <laughs> if we could, and talk about. Let me find my spy balloon <laughs> card <laughs> here, real quick. Um, well, I thought it was really interesting because. Um, uh, in the in the in the Pentagon briefings, kind of um, right right in light of right after this happened, there was a little bit of a teaser or a little bit of a, um, a talk about the potential uh, of revealing more about what the Chinese are doing sort of globally um, in in other countries that did not know that there was surveillance uh, UAVs and spy balloons flying over their own territory, maybe some dishonest activity on the part of the of the Chinese of not revealing this is what they were doing commercial activity, but they're using it for military purposes. So can you speak to that too? And also just with you know, with partners in the region who don't want to pick and choose, but maybe this is something that, that they, if it is going on in their airspace or in their, um, in their country that they should know about, just a little bit about that for both of you. Yeah, so just quickly on the, on the uh, surveillance balloon. I mean, I think the first thing to say is this was a surveillance balloon, period, yeah. okay? This is, there is no ambiguity about this. The equipment on board was for intelligence surveillance. It was equipment that's inconsistent with uh, weather balloons or whatever they were they were claiming it was. Uh, this balloon is part of a broader fleet of capabilities that we know the PRC has developed uh, to conduct surveillance operations. And as you mentioned, we know that these balloons have flown, uh, surveillance of balloons have flown over more than 40 countries across five continents. So uh, this was not just a, an isolated incident um, and uh, have not heard a plausible explanation uh, for this activity. I will say, um, I think embedded in your question there w was um, what's our understanding and sort of why haven't necessarily w we've been saying more about it. I think one of the important parts of this is because of the uh, nature of the spy balloon, this is um, inherently an intelligence issue uh, that is being handled as such in terms of um, the ongoing work associated with it. The, uh, obviously, much of the 
uh, balloon itself and the associated equipment uh, was recovered in salvage operations and is being examined very carefully now by the FBI and other uh, elements of the intelligence community and, uh, and the U.S. military. Um, but that's, we want to do that carefully, uh, and at the appropriate time, we'll be able to share uh, the, the findings associated with that. I guess I would just add to, not on the spy balloon specifically, but um, there is a pattern uh, that I think, uh, you know, a lot of Indo-Pacific partners are very familiar with, um, where you see uh, the PRC do something that very clearly violates sovereignty, in this case of the United States, in many other cases of other partners. Um, and then there's a bit of an effort to, you know, uh, with talking points and whatever, say, this is fake news, you know, nothing, nothing to see here. Um, and this is where I think uh, we believe it's incredibly important, not just in private conversations, but publicly, to shine a light on what's actually going on and to make sure that the facts are actually out there. So, for example, you saw uh, back in the wintertime, there was an incident in which um, uh, PLA rocket debris uh, fell into Philippine waters. You saw Philippine fishermen uh, went and were recovering it. Uh, and then the Chinese came in and essentially ripped it away uh, and drove off with it. And when the Philippines tried to come out and say what had happened, the PRC basically said, fake news, nothing to see here. Uh, and the Philippines said, here's the receipts. And they put it up uh, and showed the video. Um, that kind of transparency for the United States, but for other countries, I think is a big part of what we're trying to do. It's part of why the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative is important. Let's actually show what's going on in the region. It's why we have very candid and honest conversations with our partners about what we see. Um, because we think it's important to not allow these kinds of activities uh, to go on uh, unnoticed, because that slowly, I think, erodes the rules-based order in a really non-transparent way. Do, do you want to just take 60 seconds on what the IPMDA actually is, for those sure, who may not know? Because sure, it's, a, it's a really important initiative, and as Lindsay said, it's one of those things that think tankers have been talking <laughs> about for two decades, but is finally <laughs> materializing here. Probably because you have two think tankers now working in government. But uh, anyhow, important <laughs> sure. to sort of share what, what this actually is. Yeah, Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative is uh, an effort um, where uh, we announced it at the Quad uh, Summit. But essentially, we are working um, through new emerging technologies, including um, commercial radio frequency technologies, um, to create a common operating picture um, that is much more comprehensive um, and facilitates for our partners real-time data on what is actually going on in the maritime domain um, that folks can see bilaterally and that we can begin to share multilaterally in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and so quad countries are contributing um, to providing this data elsewhere in the Indo-Pacific region. As I said, we started with an initial pilot uh, just in Southeast Asia, where we've already begun providing um, a much more thorough, uh, think of it as if, um, Countries maybe had like two layers of a cake uh, in terms of what they could actually see happening in the maritime domain. And suddenly, they're looking at a seven-layer cake uh, in terms of the data that they're giving. And instead of waiting an hour for that cake to be baked, it's served on a plate immediately. That's, that's sort of what we're talking about here. Um, and so we've started in Southeast Asia, but are going to be, I think, increasingly rolling out this kind of information um, and data streams elsewhere in the region. Um, and what that does, it enables things like, for example, ships who have turned off uh, their AIS signals. So they've gone dark, and you may not have been able to see them in the past. Now you can, uh, because technology has evolved to the degree that uh, you can't essentially do these things actually in the dark anymore. Um, and so this, for us, is just a way of saying, hey, let's all see the same thing. Let's all understand what's going on. Um, so that we can't have countries who essentially are denying what's actually occurring. Um, so we're really excited about this initiative. Well, and Lindsay, it's, it is a great initiative. The information sharing is so important to all these countries for their own defense and security and their economies. But it's also part of the technological cooperation you're building up, I think. You mentioned uh, ISET, for instance, the initiative on uh, critical and emerging technologies, e Eli, and also um, AUKUS and the second pillar, for instance, and all of the advanced technologies they're going to be working on. Looking for that announcement soon, we hope. If you want to preview it here, we're happy to hear it. Um, <laughs> that would get me in a lot of trouble, okay. <laughs> as much as I would like to do that right now. But, but I wonder if I can switch the subject to another country that's giving us problems, and that's North Korea. Mm -hmm. Um, North Korea's buildup of missiles and nuclear weapons is eroding confidence in South Korea. 
um, not the UN administration, but in South Korea in general. That's what polls show. Uh, you've just gone through a series of interesting uh, uh, issues on a, a tabletop exercise with the South Koreans and uh, dialogue on extended deterrence. How well can we manage the extended deterrence question when we've got a country like North Korea which is trying to field tactical nuclear weapons to kind of blackmail South Korea and Japan and field ICBMs to kind of blackmail the United States? How do you see this playing out just with North Korea versus, you know, separate from China altogether? Yeah, no, it's a, it, it, it is a good question, uh, and, it's a, and it, it is an important issue, and, and Secretary Austin uh, has been traveling uh, on a few occasions out to Seoul to, to have these discussions, and uh, I think he's developed actually quite an excellent working relationship, uh, and frankly, friendship with Minister Lee, his mm -hmm. counterpart, out in Seoul, so they've got quite a, quite a good relationship and are talking regularly. Um, what we have been focused on uh, over the last um, several months, and particularly uh, since President Yoon came into office, is, as I said, sort of restoring elements of the alliance and elements of deterrence and U.S. extended deterrence uh, in ways that I think are, in some instances, unprecedented in response to what we're seeing out of the North. We've had uh, the restart uh, of the deployment of U.S. strategic assets to the peninsula, which had not happened for a couple of years. We've had the restart of new dialogues, senior level dialogues up to the undersecretary level around extended deterrence, which was something that was, uh, came out of uh, a presidential summit, um, the, uh, uh, which is uh, also the Defense Department does with the State Department. So that's call and call with uh, um, Bonnie Jenkins at the undersecretary level, which is an important dialogue. And we're, we're in discussions now about new mechanisms and new consultative mechanisms to get after some of the issues that, that we know are really important uh, to Seoul, which is to better understand our uh, strategic operations and uh, planning and thinking and whatnot. And so we're, we're looking toward developing those as well. We've also been doing site visits with senior Korean officials uh, to go to U.S. strategic sites to actually see and understand and meet with folks there about what we're talking about in a very concrete way. And then, of course, as you mentioned, held an important uh, tabletop exercise last week uh, on these issues. For those of you who are interested, it was a very extensive readout uh, for those who uh, follow these things and, and a lot of detail in there about the nature of that event, uh, which walked through uh, between, again, senior U.S. and South Korean officials, um, what our thinking would be in the event of uh, North Korean nuclear threats and, and actual employment. Um, so those are really important conversations. So I think across the range of these, we have a, uh, uh, I think, are feeling good about the alliance. We've also restarted uh, major live fire exercises, which is something we haven't done. Um, and again, it's, I think it's important to remember the goal of these activities, which is uh, to deter aggression and, and to deter conflict. It's not to deter Kim Jong-un from killing a bunch of fish with his missiles. Mm. Um, that's something that uh, we're focused on readiness, we're focused on deterrence, and we're focused on ensuring that, uh, again, Kim Jong-un doesn't uh, take risks uh, that go way beyond his, his capacity. Of course, his sister, Kim Yo-jong, has basically threatened that they're going to a long trajectory toward the United States closer with their future ICBM testing. So we'll wait to see what the response is when they do that. Yeah, and it's not, it's not a dissimilar answer, I don't think, to Rebecca's question, which is what do you do in the face of these threats? Mm. You keep doing what you're doing, you keep strengthening deterrence, uh, and you do it with a, a sense of confidence, uh, and you do it in a way that signals that the costs of aggression would be higher than your adversaries are going to bear. That's pretty bread and butter deterrence. We're focused on that. We're focused on readiness, uh, and uh, we're not going to slow down because of these threats. Yeah, um, I'm real quick here. So we, we want to. I want to stick with the deterrence theme. Um, you, you talked about how we brought some strategic systems back into the theater for deterrence purposes. Um, but what about and, and with these announcements of increased U.S. ally collaboration, access to uh, bases in, in, in a greater degree? But how, how can we expect, though, decisions about perhaps increased U.S. actually troops um, and weapon systems, conventional weapon systems in particular, um, that various allies have been talking about that, that, they, that, that they would feel comfortable hosting, that they would... Um, in other words, what I'm trying to get at is ally cooperation is great, but it's great to the extent that it enables us to uh, c 
convince the PRC that, that these acts of aggression are not going to be worth it, that we have the ability to respond in a yep. way. And so talk about just that. And then, if I can, specifically, uh, U.S. troops to Taiwan. Um, and um, should we expect to see more of that for training purposes and then in other, in other um, parts of the region? Okay. Well, I've already forgotten your second question, so I'm going to answer the first, uh, which is um, <laughs> that, uh, the, yeah, I mean, I guess one way to sort of restate the question that you were asking, which is sort of, we've seen some of these posture announcements. Yeah. What about the capability side yeah. of the house? Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it's an important question. Um, I, I think that is coming alongside. Uh, you will see in the uh, FY24 budget uh, major investments in the kind of capabilities that are relevant for the theater. Um, but more immediately, um, we are talking, uh, uh, obviously, with Japan about their own capabilities and their announcement that they're going to pursue a counter-strike capability. Uh, and the Ma Marine Littoral Regiment, uh, uh, which was, again, the centerpiece of the posture announcements in January with the 2 plus 2, uh, are bringing with it anti-ship capabilities and much more lethality than uh, U.S. forces had for uh, uh, prior to that. So. Um, those are coming along, and then, of course, in the AUKUS context, uh, I think we will be seeing uh, what is described in the in the Pillar Two domain, but also with the submarine effort itself, um, more capability flowing into the region. So I, the, I, I tend to think of the posture capabilities and concepts as sort of the iron triangle of deterrence in the region, uh, and we're working hard on all fronts. And I think those three together. Uh, do create that kind of deterrence in terms of more advanced capabilities that are, that are responsive to the types of operational challenges that the PRC has tried to pose, doing it through a posture that is more distributed, more, re more, more resilient, uh, more mobile, uh, more lethal, and then as it relates to concepts, actually, actually operating in new ways that's quite different than the way we've operated before. So all of those things are, are moving on quick tracks together. When we think about the scale and the scope of exercises, I mean, Lindsay, thinking about what's coming up in, in, uh, in the Philippines, um, off the coast, right, with amphibious exercises uh, there in President Marcos's hometown, I believe, or near it. Um, you know, that's exactly the kind of way to signal capabilities, but also uh, political will, shared political will, I think, to defend and deter. Um, and I, we, we've, we're over time already in terms of we wanted to get to the audience, because we've got a great audience here. So I wonder, Rebecca, we can just turn, and I, and I know our friends from the Wall Street Journal are here and Financial Times are there, so. Let's do those Michael two. Michael yeah. and Dimitri, yes, please. Yeah. Is there a microphone? Yeah. Thank you. Um, May not be able to dodge this question. <laughs> it's not a hard question. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, Michael Gordon, Wall Street Journal, a question on, you, you noted a, a number of initiatives to improve deterrence in the region. I have just some specific questions about them. So on the EDCA sites, um, uh, a question I have on that is, you know, what, what's the next step on that? I mean, it's, it's good that you have access, um, but are they going to be further developed? Are you going to bring in fuel bladders, construction, store equipment there, rotate troops through, or is it just going to be come as you are? What, what's envisioned for that, and when's it really going to happen? And then you mentioned, um, the Marine Littoral Regiment, um, what the Marines would call a stand-in force as opposed to stand off in their um, vernacular or the, the blunt layer in the, in the previous NDS. Um, uh, what, it, what else is envisioned in terms of stand-in forces that operate within the contested area under your strategy and when, that, when is that going to happen? Because even in the case of the Marines, this is a capability projected for 2025, and they're operating with an existing force design, and there's a unit in place and all that, and it's still a couple of years to make that happen. So what's, what are the next stand-in forces and posture and stru force structure changes that you're going to make to build up that deterrent capability? Okay. Lindsay, why don't you take that first one? Sure. On EDCA, I would just say um, what I think is particularly important is to say that um, any decisions about uh, the infrastructure development that occurs at sites um, and what kind of capabilities will be there is something that obviously happens in consultation with the Philippines um, because these are Philippine military facilities that we have access to. So over the next several months, I think we're finalizing uh, with the Philippines the details um, on those four sites, and a part of that will be taking a look at the sites themselves, determining uh, what infrastructure is needed uh, in order to enable us in an alliance context to operate more effectively together or in terms of 
you know, other kinds of crises or disasters we would be uh, responding to in the region. So those conversations the next several months, I think you'll see a lot more details on them. And I would say on the on the second question, um, I mean, I think it's, it's important to remember that um, the 22 NDS was the first one ever to identify China as the priority and as the pacing challenge. So uh, we have only been after this uh, for a few years in terms of the intensity and the prioritization. And I think each of the services themselves are, are thinking through, OK, what is our role in the Indo-Pacific? And in particular, what is our role forward? And the, we're seeing that from the Marines in the context of the uh, Marine Littoral Regiment and, and the one in uh, uh, Japan is, will not be the only one in the region. Uh, we're seeing it uh, from the Army in terms of their multi-domain task force, which is operating again in new ways, in exercising, and uh, in different parts uh, of the first island chain uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, the Air Force is obviously thinking through new um, concepts of how to operate in a more distributed way throughout the region, uh, et cetera. Our special forces, obviously, are thinking about what does it mean uh, to be rebalancing their focus from one that was uh, very heavy on counterterrorism to one that still includes that mission, but also uh, is focused on the pacing challenge of the PRC and what might be their role uh, in the region. So I think this is, these are, um, we're in, the, we're in the early stages of these conceptualizations, but we're already seeing them coming together. And the MLR was one. Again, the Army is there, the Air Force, uh, and, and Special Forces as well. So I think that we are, we are likely to see uh, in the coming years, uh, again, sort of the development of these concepts. And I think there's broad recognition that um, having forces forward is incredibly important, and, and including for the deterrence mission. And Dimitri Sevastopoulou. Thank you. And, and just in the, in the spirit of camaraderie, can I point out we have deterrence in the media world, and it usually means two Wall Street Journal reporters for every one <laughs> FT, <laughs> in the spirit of camaraderie. Um, Lindsay, question for you. Um, you talked about it's important to be transparent and show what China is doing. How much discussion has there been about actually releasing a lot more videos uh, showing what the Chinese fighter jets are doing vis-a-vis -vis the US and allied aircraft in the South China Sea? And Eli, you know, you've had a, an amazing range of successes over the last, you know, six to nine months with allies in, in creating what Lindsay was describing as this latticed network. But there's one area where allies are very frustrated, and particularly the UK and Australia, two Five Eyes members, and it also applies to Pillar 2 of AUKUS, which is they say, if there's a conflict in Asia, the Australians are probably going to be called to help. And yet the US has these antiquated, no foreign cannot share certain kinds of information with allies' rules, which are decades old. So you're trying to create a um, security architecture for the future with rules from the past. And I hear from London and Canberra all the time that those two don't compute. And is there not more political will needed at the top of the Pentagon and for tech transfer at the State Department, and even from the president, to say to people in the bureaucracy, this is a big strategic deal, fix the problem? <laughs> uh, uh, I guess on your, uh, Dimitri, on your first uh, question, I think overall uh, you are seeing, whether it's the U.S. or oftentimes it's other partners. Um, I mean, it's one of the brilliant uh, parts of advances in technology. It's not very hard to hold a GoPro camera if you're just sitting on a fishing boat in South China Sea. Um, so I think you're seeing a lot more of that from a number of nations. Um, on a common basis just to say, OK, we're not going to fight you uh, in talking points. We'll just show what's actually happening. Um, and I think that's actually been pretty effective, especially for smaller countries who may not always have um, the military capability uh, to push back. Uh, I think they have become quite effective in um, winning uh, the uh, you know, information war a lot of times and just putting the facts on the table out there for everybody to see. Certainly from the US side, when it comes to the concerns we have around uh, PRC operational behavior, I think you've heard us be um, much more vocal about that. Um, and that's a conversation, um, obviously, we talk to partners and, and we're talking publicly about uh, because we think it matters. Um, we think it matters for people to understand not just what's going on, 
Um, but as Eli said, for us to say publicly the same things that we're saying to the PRC privately, which is, look, these have these kinds of unsafe operational behaviors carry real risks with them, uh, and seeing something like you know an accidental uh, incident uh, because of unsafe behavior turning into a conflict is something we all want to avoid. So that's one of the reasons you hear us talking a lot about this right now. Yeah, and, and I would say. Dimitri, to your question, um, I mean, I think I agree with your characterization, uh, which is that, yes, we have antiquated systems that need to be revised, and we're in the process of doing so. And I think the nature of the, t the types of cooperation that we're uh, trying to realize here are driving those changes. And, and mm -hmm. AUKUS is a good example of that, where if it relates to technology sharing, uh, yes, we need to change the way that we share technology with our partners. We're having those conversations in the India context as well as we're thinking about, um, you know, previously parts of the bureaucracy that would have said, no, we can't share that. And uh, the answer from the policy and strategy perspective being, uh, no, we're going to have to share that to make this work in terms of getting to the kind of more capable, integrated future that we want in the Indo-Pacific. So I think you are seeing sort of live evolution of uh, processes around technology sharing, around foreign military sales, around our own uh, defense industrial base in response to this. Um, and we're also seeing it uh, sort of embedded in your question there. I think I would, I would submit that in our closest alliances and partnerships, we're having much better conversations about uh, issues related to operations and planning uh, and no kidding uh, defense uh, areas such as that in a way that hasn't happened uh, previously. If I, we've got time for just one very quick question. I want to respect their time, and then I'll close us out with one last one. So we'll just go right here. Yeah. Uh, you can state your name, please. Uh, microphone. I'm Isaac Marogi. I'm a medical doctor and a retired military. Uh, when I was in CENTCOM region, we used to get the surgeon generals of areas and discuss uh, in, in, in our areas of operation, collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of non-lethal assistance to our allies and partner nations in, in the region you discussed, can you tell us about initiatives where, where, where we can, is there any, tell us about initiatives in terms of collaborations with, at the healthcare and medical engagement? Uh, sure, happy to. Um, you know, I would just say, one, uh, we still have, uh, you know, the Indo-PACOM, uh, does a lot of work related to military medicine cooperation. And certainly over the past few years under COVID, we have seen that the work that the United States has done as a whole in terms of vaccine delivery, but also that the Defense Department has done uh, supporting that, not just for other partner defense forces, um, but helping them actually do COVID relief in their own countries has been one of the most impactful things uh, that we consistently hear from partners that they have appreciated about the United States and our engagement over the last few years. So let me give you an example. In Vietnam, uh, the US Department of Defense helped facilitate cold storage for vaccines in every single Vietnamese province. And that supported the work that the United States was doing, giving vaccines to that country. Um, we saw the first time that the secretary went out to Manila, which was still under uh, former President Duterte, one of the first things we heard from President Duterte and his administration was the number one thing they appreciated was the, I think, over 60 million vaccine doses that the United States had given to the Philippines. Uh, we gave those things free, uh, and we provided that support with no strings attached. Um, and I think our partners understand that that is an important and a different part of how the United States does business. If I could just um, ask this last question that's going to be an impossible one, I think, to answer in a short amount of time. It's yours. Um, <laughs> but, but, I, but I think it's really important. We're, we're focused right now on China and, and what China is doing um, regionally, but across, um, across the planet. But, but there is a very significant, terrible war going on in Europe. Um, Russia's uh, unlawful, illegal, unprovoked uh, war of aggression against Ukraine. So my, my question is, um, just I just want to hear your response with the busy work that you all are doing right now on really trying to tackle the China problem. Do, are, do you feel as though the country is overly distracted with this war to, the, to a disadvantage of the work that you believe needs to happen to, to, to deter and then prepare to defend um, should deterrence fail? 
Uh, no, I, I don't think we're distracted from the, the China challenge. I think you've seen the strategy documents uh, out of the Pentagon. Uh, for those of you who have worked in the Pentagon, uh, <laughs> is a very strategy and guidance directed organization. Those things just don't set on the shelf. On the shelf underneath them, they have guidance documents and implementation documents. Uh, and I think as it relates to uh, attention and resources, uh, the Defense Department is living the stated prioritization of the PRC, even while it's managing, uh, the obviously, the, the war in Russia, which is the, the urgent challenge there. Yeah. I would say you can see that in the, in the Secretary's time and in his travels, too. I mean, in September, he had the United States, Japan, Australia, the Philippines, sort of an unprecedented meeting where we had allies together in Hawaii. Um, in November, he was in Cambodia doing the ADM Plus. In January, he was uh, visiting uh, with Manila and the ROK. Um, he is putting his money where his mouth is um, in terms of making sure that he is showing up to engage our allies and partners and talk about what integrated deterrence in an alliance context looks like. This has been a great discussion. I wish we had more time. But I think the, the thing that just stands out for me, uh, Eli and Lindsay, is that for all the bad things that are happening, the alliances, the partnerships are getting stronger, more resilient. You are building this creative, broad architecture. Um, good luck with you, you know, for both of you to, to do even more of it, to implement more of it, because uh, it's urgently needed. So thank you again. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you all for joining us here at you. Yeah.